Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. First of all, I want to welcome all the students who are here, potential students who are here as mm -hmm. part of an open house that just met earlier. So welcome. Woo -hoo! This is our yeah. And because we're here in the Manhattan boonies, I want to make sure um, <laughs> all of the Manhattan students know Bob Reeves, who's over here in the corner, who's the yeah, most of all of and Julie Sheehan, who's the director of the MFA program and creative writer. <laughs> and over on the far side, we're doing like a, it would be bad at rolling. <laughs> Carla Cagliotti, who's the dean of the MFA program. Um, we have a couple of announcements. One of our students who came through the MFA program right here in Manhattan, um, Bob Morris, has recently let us know that his memoir about, it's so tied into what we've been talking about, his memoir about t caring for his parents while they were dying has just um, been picked up by 12, so we're excited for him. Yeah. yeah. He's one of our early first students. And then on the filmmaking front, um, I don't know if we have any 2020s here. But ours, oh yay, Michelle. <laughs> um, our students who came through the filmmaking program this year, one of them is in the finalist selection at Sundance, one of them has a screenplay in um, the Writer and Director's Lab at the Actors Studio, one's in the African American Film Festival in the Hamptons, so they're just propagating out in the world. Um, also, uh, for students in the MFA program, the spring schedule should be announced shortly. And also, if you're a non-matric and you want to know about classes you could take with us, we have a sign-up sheet over on the table. So please let us know if you'd like to be on our email blasts. Um, and then just a little run of show. Susan's going to read. And then Dan and Susan will have a conversation. And then we'll open it up to questions. And just so you know, um, we've been studying this book for two weeks and having many conversations about it and writing essays and coming up with theories. So it's going to be a very avid Q&A from the audience. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, this course grew out of a series of conversations Dan Maneker and I had while um, watching our dogs frolic in the dog run on 87th Street and the west side. And um, I think the course has a lot of that feeling. There's a frolicky feeling while talking about dire things that's been very fun. And um, I think it's also part of the book. It's, there's a beautiful poetry to it, but I won't talk about that because you'll discover that yourself. Um, Dan was also Susan's editor at The New Yorker when I think the first stories that went into Monkeys came out and uh, published many of them. So that's a really exciting tie-in. And um, Dan, who probably wouldn't like to have his horn tooted, I know that sounds terrible, um, <laughs> was chosen to give a TED talk at TED by um, Stony Brook University. So we're very proud of him. Many, many applicants. So we have a TED talker here. Um, and then, as many of our students will tell you, we read Susan Minot's Lust in our very first course of the um, entire program, CWL 500, and we study it. I personally studied Monkeys for its exploration of child's voice, and Evening is a beautiful exploration of voice at the other end of the spe spectrum. But for me personally, this book was incredibly meaningful because just as my mother found out she was dying, the book came out, I read it, I sent it to her, and it was just this hand across this um, river we could never travel together, and it means so much to me, so I'm very delighted to welcome her tonight. But to introduce her properly, please welcome our new GA um, graduate assistant, Harmony Hazard. Most people read books to escape. They read about exotic beaches or exotic sex, other planets and worlds far, far away. They seek out fiction that is amusing, fun, or easy. Then why would any healthy person choose to read about, <laughs> discuss, and contemplate death and illness? This is a question that the uses of affliction class, taught by Daniel Miniker and Magdalene Brandeis, has pondered profusely. In reading Susan Minutes, sorry, Minutes' extraordinary <laughs> novel, Evening, we may have come closer to an answer. Evening invites the reader onto the deathbed of Anne Lord, 
a deathbed strewn with memories, metaphors, hallucinations, grief, and all kinds of revelations. Anne Lord's deathbed becomes so enthralling that it becomes hard to walk away. Yes, Susan does throw in some exotic beaches and some exotic sex. But it is the questions that surround the theme of death that we return to. What does matter in life? What will we remember when we are dying? How does the reminder of death help us enjoy life right now? And what does any of this have to do with the fleeting moments of love that may feel as if they stay always, even when bodies do not? It takes an author of courageous strength to encourage someone towards, instead of away from, a deathbed and all of the questions tangle in its sheets. Susan Minot has that strength. Using mesmerizing language, Evening revels and reflects on the meanings of life, love, time, and death, with the effect of rendering a reader astonished at how close language can touch. This is not a book to escape outwards with, but rather a book to go inwards with. It is not a far away world we witness, but the one we are most intimate with already, the one inside ourselves. I quote, nothing was herself but what had happened to her, and the only place that, would, that was registered was inside. Susan Mina is a master of evoking the questions and feelings that really matter. And this is why we read about illness, not because it's amusing or fun or easy, it's not, but because it's essential that we look at the ultimate narrative arc, the one of our lives. I quote from Evening about Anne, her life had not been long enough for her to know the whole of herself. It had not been long enough or wide. With Susan Minot present tonight, our lives are made a little bit wider. And in this new space, we can get to know ourselves a bit more. We are thrilled to have the exceptional Susan Minot as the first reader for Writers Speak. It is my honor to introduce Susan Minot. lean forward. Um, I can safely say, Harmony Hazard, that that is the nicest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> really, thank you very much. Um, this is sort of odd. You can sit in the back. Oh, does it? Okay. It's pretty good, yeah. Okay. Doesn't seem like it will, but it does? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm um, just, if you've all read this, I'll, I'll just read like little little bits, I said to, to Danny that there was such a, like a happy, like you were saying, frolicsome atmosphere <laughs> here at Stony Brook. It's just <laughs> so nice. I teach my writing class and it's, it's not so fun. They're not so <laughs> jolly and everything. And he said, oh, well, just start reading and you can bring them all really down. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to read some little bits of... Uh, um, of the parts that are particularly about illness. The world shifted as if a piece of paper had been flipped and she was now living on its other side. Things turned transparent, the man one married, the house one lived in, the bracelet one wore. They all became equal to each other, equal motes of dust drifting by. Strange things were happening Something has already happened. For two days, a leaf the size of a ham hung in the air one foot from her face. She grew sensitive to the different shades of white on the ceiling. Her sense was not always right. The position of her arm had something to do with inviting people to dinner. She needed to move the pillow so a boat could dock there. She knew it wasn't logical and wondered if the drugs were obscuring things then it seemed as if the drugs were making it easier to read the true meaning. Let's turn ourselves a bit. Let's try a little lunch. Let's have a little sip. Let's sit a little up. I'm not hungry. Keep up our strength, said the nurse. A wave of nausea swept through her. This is not what she'd planned. She'd always planned to go quickly. A man's shoulder was coming through the wall. He's come back, said Anne Lord. Who? I thought he'd forgotten. They always come back, 
said the nurse. The line between her dreams and waking life disappeared. She had no idea what day it was. They said it was July. A month had gone by since the last of the tests. A chilling phrase, run some tests. They made her drink poison, poked and prodded, pulled blood out in purple threads. Then came Dick Baker's casual voice, could she come into the office? She felt like hell, silence on the line. Why don't I just stop by on my way home, he said, in this way, telling her. Then the days at the hospital, which is no place for sick people. There, you blurred into something else in rooms with brown stripes down the walls and plastic under the sheets and curving aluminum bars and windows that didn't open. People wore crumpled masks and the furniture rolled. She lay under the machine shaped like a bull's head and needles were tapped into place, taped into place and needles pulled out. Visiting hours were over. In the middle of the night, buzzers went off, and in the morning, when you rolled your IV by the next room, saw the empty bed with the blank clipboard and no more bald woman named Guinevere. She had brought her own nightgown not to wear the dreadful tie things they gave you and always spilled her orange juice peeling off the top. No, there's no question of her going back to the hospital. There were days when it was true, then it was not true, then it was true again. After the treatment stopped, she felt better, then worse, then she saw there was nothing to make it better. It quickly got worse. She woke before dawn, coughing. She could make out the shape of the glass of the water on the table, but it was too far to reach, and after a while she managed to stop coughing without drinking. She lay still as the room grew light, the blue ceiling turned gray, then light gray. It was thoroughly quiet. It seemed to be the beginning of something more than just day. For a few long moments, she lay and felt, what was it? The dawn light put her in mind of creation. It must have been this way on the actual first day of the world. A thin yellow light spread out, and all the sorrows which sat in her seemed suddenly to lift up and fly off and were replaced with the most inappropriate hope. For what had she to hope for? A swift end, perhaps. And yet her whole spirit was lifting. She felt hope not only for herself, but it did sound absurd for all humanity. She lay here on a trembling leaf and thought of all the other people lying on their leaves, waiting for the sun to come up. And it seemed as if they were quiet and patient. What each of them wanted would eventually come. She was sure of it. An orange glow filled the room. The glass on the bedside table began to sink. She closed her eyes for a moment to concentrate, and the pain got worse. This was the darkness she would be looking at for a long time, she opened her eyes. The glass continued sinking. She could not see the water in it, only the top rim. She struggled to keep it in sight. The glass was going very slowly, but it was important that she see it the moment it disappeared. She smelled the pillow beside her. A yellow suitcase came flying out of the fog. It was dragged over loose stones, thrown into a car, hauled over the polished floor. It lay open on a suitcase rack at the foot of a bed. She walked through light, stripes of light and shadow. Something rattled. There had been rain in New Haven and a hot wind off the platform in Providence. They were waiting for her in Boston. Her li lipstick rolled on the ground and the face with the sunglasses was luminous. I'll just read this one last part. This is the section called report from Nurse Brown, which was actually a uh, sort of five or six page short story, which was really all I was planning on writing. <laughs> <laughs> it turned into this book. Okay. So it's page 145. Her eyes stared ahead with pupils 
small dots from, with her pupils small dots from morphine. Nurse Brown set the tray quietly down without rattling and sat and waited. She spooned some rice and brought it to Anne Lord's lips. The lips parted, but the mouth didn't open. The front teeth were set together in concentration. Nurse Brown did not like to give in to them when they refused to eat. She prodded with the spoon, just a taste, she said. She took back the spoon and held it above her lap. Hush, Anne Lord said. Her face seemed to Nurse Brown as if a light had been thrown from beneath it, and she saw in Anne Lord the young face she'd seen in some of the photographs around the house. There was one of Anne Lord as a young woman with her hair blowing and her teeth white in profile. Nurse Brown picked up the tray and left the room. She sat next door in the room with the pilgrim wallpaper. In the corner was a small gray TV, which she sometimes turned on without the sound while she did the crossword or looked through a magazine. The ceiling had water stains. It was true of the best houses. She sat with the door ajar and listened as she'd listened in hundreds of other rooms with glasses gathered on bedside tables and boxes of plastic needles and checkerboard squares for pills and cotton balls and cards propped up, rooms of yellow stains and dressing gowns draped over chairs and piles of unread books. She knew that downstairs by the back door there were seamed vases from the florist empty with dry foam cubes and knew how the air in the room grew close from sleeping. A change of sheets swept hope through the room. She no longer needed to see the visitors. Their voices were familiar. She knew the coats spotted with rain and umbrellas drip, dripping in the hall and the presents tied with bows. There were silent visitors with furrowed brows, ones who didn't stop chattering, ones who whispered to her conspiratorially, and ones who looked through her. She was just the nurse. Smiles might be expressions of fright. Some people with cheerful natures remained unintimidated by pain. Other compassionate ones were undone. Restless people made short visits. One could only imagine how many were too uneasy to come at all. Some people were stunned and seemed oddly unmoved. The older ones were familiar with this business, and their hands sat resigned in their laps, and they spoke little. Children skipped in on the rug or burst into tears. Sometimes they were made to kiss the sick person, which they did with trembling arms. And always there were the ones who flocked to sick beds, regardless of their relation, the ones who brought casseroles and knocked on the door at the wrong time. Nurse Brown saw her patient watch all this for the first time. The face propped against the pillows grew more still and watchful as the days went by till it stopped turning, and soon only the eyes moved, going from one visitor to the next, watching with trepidation a cup approach. And in the early hours of the morning, Nurse Brown saw another face in the lamplight, the face wild with pain, pleading for this not to be true, a face incredulous and lost. A nurse's first obligation was to bring comfort to the patient, and there is no reason in this day and age for pain to be overwhelming. When consciousness was not engaged, a patient was more susceptible to pain, so night was a critical time. Sometimes patients refused medication, saying their minds were too confused. It wasn't usual, but she'd seen it, some preferring pain to confusion. Anne Lord reached for her hand. Make it go away, she said. Her hand was small and dry. Nurse Brown bent down for a fresh needle. No, Anne Lord said. It's over there. She pointed over Nurse Brown's shoulder. Tell it to go away. Nurse Brown glanced behind her. It will go away when it's ready, she said. University is generous. Two, two mics. <laughs> oh.
Uh, Susan and I have known each other for uh, too long. Um, that is to say, it's embarrassing. Twenty years, thirty, more like thirty. More like thirty. More like thirty. Yeah. yeah. So it's nice to see her. I don't see her often. I see her on Metro North from time to time. <laughs> That's about it. You know, the questions about this book, which are, uh, which is about um, a woman who is dying. Um, are kind of, I mean, the ones that I have now, after having read it a long time ago and now having reread it and been somewhat inexplicably more uh, impressed and um, almost intimidated by it than I was the first time. Um, but the questions are obvious ones. There's not going to be any like clever Clive James sort of like textual analysis. What I mean, to the point of the banal, what made you write it? What was your, what was your idea? When did it start? You just explained that there was a short story that was. There similar. was going to be there was going to be a very short story called "Report from Nurse Brown," and it was sort of based on. Um, uh, it was probably. The idea came kind of ten years after I'd watched two people close to me die after. Not a very long illness for, for both of them. Um, about a month for my grandmother, and at least the bedridden part for a friend of mine with leukemia, who was a young man who died when he was 35, a writer named um, Alexis Ullman. Is that one okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, having been through those experiences, I guess I could explain by saying it uh, bothered me a lot to <laughs> watch two people um, I cared about die, and it didn't really leave me. Um, I did have, and this was in, in a way like Anne Lord finding this I've never really thought of it this way before, but finding the balsam pillow that she smells. Um, I, after my grandmother died, uh, the notebook that the nurse had left, um, a sort of blue notebook from, you know, you get in a pharmacy, not even a stationery store kind of notebook, had this, and I think it's, it's in the next page of what I was going to read. It just has the little jotting downs kind of every hour on the hour of what, um, you know, what she, how she treats the patient. And it, you know, the last page that she wrote down was, you know, patient expired very much like I, I sort of lifted it and put it into the book. And, um, the, the power of seeing that page being very clinical and yet with such uh, saying something so large, not only the end of a person's life, but that it was sort of this weird way of describing pain, which is, of course, a very hard thing, obviously, you guys are talking about, too to write about. Um, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to write a story from the point of view of uh, this nurse, like only having it be the notebook. So it was called Report from Nurse Brown, and it was only going to be the notebook, and it would be probably a little bit boring because you'd have the, you know, wiped her, fed her this, how much, but in between have who was visiting, like because sometimes they would note that down, you know, sister came to visit, or, but because Nurse Brown was going to be a little bit more of a, um, documentarian, she'd note a little bit more. And somehow I thought maybe I could write this story about what was going on around this dying woman and family fighting or whatever would be going on in a sort of tricky way, so you'd read it. And as I was writing it, it was sort of tricky and it was a little bit of a gamey thing and I started to realize the reason I was writing it because I was much more interested in what was going on in the mind of the person who was dying. <laughs> and of course, which I thought of a lot with these, these two people close to me. And so 
I thought, well, you know, it, it's not such a stretch to acknowledge that we all are in some way, not in the process of dying from an illness, but we all are dying. I mean, I think the, <laughs> the verb is very funny to say someone is dying. You, you're really n not dying, you're dead or you're alive. <laughs> and people say you're dying and we just understand, but it's really a, a misuse of, of the word. It means you're about to die, that's okay, but no, we're all dying. <laughs> if that's the... So I thought, what's going on in her mind? And um, I would say, it's safe to say with almost all my books, um, I ask myself a question that I don't really want to answer. Like, it's not to entertain myself, it's more to, to go someplace where um, initially I think I'm not interested in that. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in asking it, but I'm not really sure how that can be an inviting place to explore. So, Therefore, I kind of stuck with it. And there was a surprise in it, and it's always very irritating for me to hear writers when they say, I was writing this, and then suddenly this thing happened. Like, the characters decided they were going to go to Fiji. You know, and I'm like, well, no, they didn't decide. You wrote the words. And, you know, characters don't decide to, to do anything. Um, it's absolutely only what you <laughs> decide to make them do. But what I didn't know would happen in the process of this book was I thought what's going to go on in her mind, that's going to be what I want to try to depict. And, you know, I had given the personality of the person and I thought, okay, she, um, you know, what would I do if I were in a lot of pain lying there knowing that I wasn't going to leave this room ever? I think I would um, try to think of something diverting, you know. <laughs> I would try to think of something good instead of I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I think we all, if we have that resource of sort of any kind of fantasy life or any sort of place where we can go in our minds. So, um, but, but I didn't want her to be, that to be her usual uh, way of, of coping with things like it is for some of us. <laughs> um, I wanted her to not be like that and I wanted her to come upon something as if, oh, she was sort of surprised to come upon a memory and because the memory brought back this sort of warm thing that happened of falling in love with someone and maybe a time in her life when there was a lot of things open to her and stuff, that she would somehow hook into that memory. And in the way that we like to go over a lovely experience we've had. You start at the beginning, you know what, no, 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 go back a little further, let's go over that again. She goes through almost hour by hour these three or four days when she fell in love with this man. And I thought, you know, and so uh, whatever, you, different questions come up as you write, and so you, you don't have them all at once, they come as you're writing. And the other question, which is maybe probably there, um, near the beginning, after what is important in a life, and is do you start to recognize that when you're on your deathbed, which I'm not really sure you do, but if your life is over and you can look back on it like on a film or something, you'll be able to say, mm, this was a really bad moment, and you'll be able to say, this was a really good moment. And if you're being really, you know, squaring it all away, you could probably say, this was the best moment. And I think for Anne Lord, who did a lot of not looking at her life as she lived it, I think she went sort of to the next thing that seemed to sort of make sense to her, um, turns out 
this was something that came to her. So what I didn't think would happen is that she was going to learn something dying. Did you do medical research? I did, uh, not, no, not medical research. I did, I read, you know, kind of source material things by nurses. Um, more about, I did kind of reading about, you know, hospice type things. So more, you know, the kind of delirium that people get in when they're dying and they, you know, there were certain facts I'd come, so that kind of medical research I did. I wasn't, it wasn't about cancer, but there's one really good one that they said almost always in the last 24 hours, like dead people start, or not always, but that's when the other dead people start appearing with a person dying. This could have been a hoo-hoo-hoo kind of book I was reading, but... The other dead people in their minds? Yes. That we could have hallucinate. That they hallucinate, but it's the dead people that are... So for, the, for some, this was a, one book that was written by a woman that had worked with a lot, or been around a lot of people dying, so she had a lot of good stories. Um, did you have, this is a very ornately structured book, although the wonder of it is that it doesn't feel that way. Uh, you know, John McPhee is famous for his nonfiction, putting index cards up and moving them around. Did you have, as you wrote the book, did you begin to have a kind of method of what was going to go where, and did you make an outline? And Because you know, it's seamless, but I know it's not. I mean, I know in the creation of it, there were scenes. Yeah, well, I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, table of contents, um, what I started to do is I kind of write, I mean, I knew, you know, she was gonna be sick at the beginning and at the end she was gonna die. Okay, so I knew that was gonna happen in, in the present tense. And I knew, and I was going to stay in real time, and I knew that the three or four days that she was remembering were going to go in, in consecutive time also, right? So I, I figured that out. I'm not sure I... And then, so they were separate outlines. Um, I would say the most part of the outline that I did was the wedding, the, the weekend. The um, the sequence, yeah. And there was the dinner, and then there was the bridal dinner, and then what would... So I had that, I had that kind of blocked out. And then I had to block out, as we went through time, you know, her deterioration. And I had to figure out when people were visiting her, and what was going on with the children. And so I started to... You know, I, I often write... Um, I don't write linearly. I can barely even say the word. <laughs> um, so I write in a lot of short takes, and then I maybe, they're not index cards, they're probably four or five pages of, of a scene. And then I'll kind of move those around. And then I'll start seeing like the, the balsam pillow, the yellow suitcase, the torches. I had, and I'm not sure, they're even obvious. There's definitely an organizing principle for what was in the yellow suitcase, like what and Lord present day things I put into that section. Like I would slightly organize it by theme a little bit. Like maybe there would be a lot of movement in that or something. This is just to keep myself, you know, but kind you, of you interested. Were separate documents. I mean, in other words, you were writing, but were you? Also, either in advance planning. Yes. Were you also taking notes as you wrote? In other words, yes. Sort of writing the book and also looking at the architecture at the same time. Yes. yes. So I would write. You know, I I try to stick with the linear thing because the wedding. I at least knew. You know, that's easy to block out. Right. Bridal dinner, the, the right. wedding, the party after, or whatever. Um, the disaster after the wedding. Um, and then I'd get an idea and i think, oh, 
either this should, something else should go earlier, or th something else should go later, and I, I would write it then instead of sort of waiting. As with most questions, I have a guess at the answer. They which can't one, hear which you. One, I think so. <laughs> which was that this is one of those tapestries that, I mean, this is really a tapestry book in a way, and usually when they're successful, they do have, they have to have some scaffolding in advance, otherwise to juggle all this. Yeah, well that, 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 I mean, there's a very strong scaffolding of there's a wedding going on, right? Her, it's actually her um, flashback is the scaffolding. Do you know why you decided on this life and death, that is, a woman of a certain age, three marriages, certain relationships with her children, do you, I, without necessarily tracing it back to personal experience, do you know where it all came from? Um, do I know where it all came, it came from me? No. <laughs> it all came from me. Um, I, you know, I can tell you, you could ask me why was the woman this age, and I would say this is the age that my mother would have been in 1990, whatever. And she died when she was young, and I just thought, I'm gonna make the woman be born in that. And then, um, why did she have three marriages? I wanted her to have not just like one marriage and then the man who got away, kind of. I wanted her to have a sort of rich life of relationships with men, so it wouldn't be like a Bridges of Madison County type thing, like country, whatever it's called. <laughs> um, you know, just, she was sort of attached to one person, but there was the one other story. I want, I wanted there to be a lot of stories that she had, and to have different ones, and, and also um, to go sort of against the type, which is usually there's a woman and she's dying and she's surrounded with all her family and friends and she's the connecting link to all of them and they they don't know what they're going to do without her. No, I wanted them to be, you know, to have a, a sort of, yeah, like someone who wasn't the lovable. If you saw any, saw the movie of Evening, you'd find that the woman in that was like a different character. You know, she was, darling, I love you, you know, whatever, and that's not... You know, and so I, I wanted her to not be How much like did you have that. To do with the movie? I had something to do with it initially, <laughs> <laughs> and then as it went on, it got further and further away. Um, because I did have something to do initially with it, uh, writing a few um, screenplay drafts and stuff. They kept my name on it. And um, I think I can say this now, though at the time the movie was coming out, we had to be all like we worked on it together and everything, but I'd safe to say that there isn't one word that's in that <laughs> movie. Not only that I wrote, but it's really even in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you guys, if you read the book, you know it well. You can look at it, and you'll see. We, I think we asked them not to look at the movie yeah. if they had Yeah, well, you can look at it now, because it's very amusing. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just interesting to see how something, everything got sort of tweaked slightly in a different direction, almost on, what's the word, you know, a commitment to make sure everything was a little changed, <laughs> right? So it doesn't add up, really. I mean, one major thing they did is, you know, Harris Arden has a fiance who suddenly complicates things, right, by saying that she's pregnant and he sort of is semi-honorable enough to, you know, stick with her. Well, they, that is too complicated. <laughs> Just get rid of the fiance. And so, and then you watch this movie, it's like, well, so why weren't they together? Like, what was the tragic thing that kept them? Whatever, something split them apart at the end. You don't know why. <laughs> I'm going to stop asking questions because the students have a lot, but I, there are two more sort of shortish ones. One of them intrusive, and you can answer it, I think, without rising to the intrusive bait, which is, have you ever taken morphine? Which is so exquisite. I can answer that I know. I never have. That surprises me because... <laughs> but I've seen people on it. Also, yeah, it's so 
accurate to that. Oh, really? Oh, that's good oh, to hear. God. Yeah. It's, yeah. Dan, have you taken I have, I have under surgical circumstances. Uh, and I have to say that these are brilliant imaginings because that sense of being totally in touch and completely confused, especially, you're clearer than you've ever been and totally at the same time know that you're not. It's beautif beautifully done. Okay. Then also, who, where did you come up in the passage you read with the name Guinevere? You said that woman, Guinevere, I mean, who's just thrown away uh -huh. some part of the... Yeah. Is it Nurse Brown's recollection? Yes. No, no, no. It's um, it's it's Anne Lord's talking about when she's getting all the tests and she spends the night in the hospital and you hear buzzers going off and then the next morning when you Guinevere go by, the man, woman named Guinevere, you figure she's she like met. Where, where Why that name? name? Yeah. <laughs> is it um, Arthurian? I'll it tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you that to me... Or turn off the movie, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's it's someone you wish dead. <laughs> I never thought of it that. That's why I can't answer the question because it's someone. It's it's someone's name. That is that is. I never really. I never really meant it that way. But this is what awful editors do. I mean, things that sort of popped out like. Strange, strange. It was someone I can't mention, put it that way. Okay. Well, finally, finally for me, and I have a million more now that I've read it so carefully, um, um, this is based in part on the deaths of people that you, you know. Did, as you wrote the book, did you change your attitude toward death and dying that you might have had before, or did you have none before? or none in particular? Um, I would say it did change a bit. Um, because, I don't know, the four years that I was writing this book, I had to put myself in the mind of someone dying, which was, you know, not frolicky and cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> which was sort of a slightly masochistic thing to do, I would say. But I, I was kind of doing it in in the spirit of kind of solidarity with these people I knew who had died, I guess. So now maybe if I see someone dying, I don't feel so not that I've done it yet. <laughs> so <laughs> or about to die, but I I, I maybe, um, it doesn't push me away in the same way. Like she was describing, you know, people, it's a, it's a hard, it's hard to look at people who are in pain and, and the pain's just going to take them off somewhere. You know, it's the whole thing, it's not, nothing reassuring you can say, you can't even reassure your, yourself. So maybe I feel closer to the experience so I don't feel um, as distant from, right. from but, people. But yeah. maybe not as upset either by it. I'm not sure about that. Well, Roth, Philip Roth says um, in the book about his father's death, whose name I've forgotten, um, that he doesn't think it's fair for people to have to work so hard at the end. And mm -hmm. I have to say, having been through a certain amount of death in my family as well, this is one of the things that struck me in that evening, which is the hard work that has to be done unless a safe hits you or you're struck right. by a stroke. Right. And um, I just, this has nothing to do with your book. I just want to tell everybody, yeah. it's not fair. No, <laughs> no, 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 it's not it, fair. It really doesn't make any sense. And, um, these but I will say, I thought that's where, I thought that was the sort of, last note that I was aiming for the whole time in the book because it's it can make one angry <laughs> that it's not fair right. you know um, but you and know, but that's not the way the book ends but that's not the way the book ends there is a and again it was 
Maybe it was clutching at straws, you know, or maybe it was just finding some thing that, oh, actually, I hadn't really thought about it, that she could, and I think sh this woman does, she's, you know, and she, she even acknowledges it at certain points, she didn't really know herself, maybe, and she didn't, she wasn't really kind of living her life. And maybe that acknowledgement was a kind of delivery yeah. for her. Well, when right? you realize More that. than just, I'm not going nowhere, that's it. Right. Oh, she, she discovered something true about her experience. Well, also, it retroactively kind of cancels it out. I mean, one fell swoop. Yes. And yes. suddenly she understands herself in a way she well, didn't not quite. And no. she missed it. I mean, she missed, she missed a lot, her. but she she's her. understanding yeah. something she experienced but hadn't reflected on or something. This so it turns weird. out, if you're lying there and you're in terrible pain, something still might come to you. Right. And something does come to her. So that's but the... We talked about this like 32% of the time in her class. And so I'm going to turn it over, not only to the class, but to any visitors or MFA candidates to see if you have any questions. Magdalene. <laughs> you get to go first. Um, what I kept getting drawn back to, both as a writer and as a reader, I'm so curious how you, like, we all have an editor that wants to make a perfect sentence. And as her mind is deconstructing, you do this in child's language too to me in monkeys, but it's like you find a way to deconstruct the rules of grammar or language where it still keeps its order and still makes sense. And I'm just curious, I'm sure you knew in yourself as a writer how you wanted something to look and sound, but I'm curious about the relationship with an editor when you went to publication. Like I would imagine. How, how, uh, how was that? <laughs> <laughs> This, is, this person is a champion of danglers. That's, that's one of the, she says, I want my dangler. She says, I say, this is a dangler. And she says, yes. She's so sweet. She says, yes, I know. But you know, I kind of like it. That sounds pathetic, Dan. I kind is, of like it. I have more she, justification than she that. She is. No, there wasn't. Uh, yes, there is. <laughs> As a rose is a rose is a rose, a dangler, dangler is dangler is a dangler is a dangler. But she, but Susan, from my experience, knows what she wants to do. Now, I don't know about editing of the book, because you had graduated. Well, I, I, um, I just, I've just finished a book. Um, yeah. That <laughs> well, just finished it. I finished it about a year ago. It was done. <laughs> And then we kept on finishing it for the last year. Um, me and my editor, whose name is Jordan Pavlin, and then my copy editor, who I never met, but I felt like I was having a love affair with her because she had to read this very long, it's the long, longest book I've written. Um, and it was, she wrote me a very nice letter at the beginning before I got the, you know, the, the pages were talking about, well, this is just first the manuscript before it's even in. And she said, okay, I understand you have, <laughs> she goes, I get it. <laughs> she goes, I get it that you're, you have unconventional grammatical <laughs> and punctuation. This one's even worse, this, this book that I just wrote. Um, but I'm going to, she goes, I'm not going to, and she say, jam fistedly, you know, put in all the commas, but I'm going to tell you, you know, where mostly they belong. And, and you can decide. You know, maybe you didn't realize that it should have gone. So, <laughs> but this woman was a, a, a machine, and I mean that in the most admiring way, because... There's no, I don't use quotation marks in this last book either. And she would often, um, 
put like just she was doing pink. I had to do something else, but a very, very light little underlining in the bottom of the line if there was like supposed to be something there that I hadn't put. And she couldn't help it. She did it every, she did it on page 300. She still put the like, maybe I wanted the quotation marks here, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> clearly after page 10. Anyway, she couldn't help it. And I probably took, you know, a comma, um, one out of 10, maybe. That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I would say a, uh, a very, I have a, a patient editor and uh, <laughs> the happy editor. You, you work. Yeah, but even more so. Here's what I think. Well, I, I'll tell you later. Yeah. Um, other questions, please. Yes, Jackie. What surprised you about death and dying in the process of writing? Did your ideas change? Um, well, I, I think I said two of the things that surprised me. One was that you could be lying there with nothing to truly look forward to. I mean, nothing more was ever going to happen to you. And yet something more could still happen to you because you're with your mind. And you're with your memories and you're with your reflection and something can still come to you. What about religion? God? Was that, <laughs> was that a part of? The, the, the give me a little that, more of a specific. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what about religion? Well, I, I was thinking of all, all the mention about glass, and I thought about 1 Corinthians, uh, seeing through a glass darkly. Did that enter your mind at all while you were writing about glass? That's funny you say that. I was just talking about that that line with someone recently and because I was reading another translation of it that instead of seeing through a glass darkly which we always think it's like seeing through a window pane apparently the um, the, the the Greek was more had to do with a mirror yes. and like you see you're looking at a reflection so it's not really through a glass it's like we see ourselves in a dark mirror, which is very different than seeing through a glass darkly means seeing the world, like we're seeing an illusion, but we're either talking about the world or ourselves. Um, I, I wasn't thinking of that particularly, but I'm sure that's in my brain because I went to a um, boarding school called Concord Academy, and we went to chapel three mornings a week. And up on the, um, the whole front of the chapel was a big wooden engraving with like letters this big of St. Paul's letters to the Corinthians. So I read that every day to <laughs> <laughs> that I got in there. You didn't answer the religion question. There's well, I don't know what the question is. I mean, I, I'd like to answer. I'll ask you. Yeah. Is there religion in this book? Um, is there spirituality in this book? If you wish. I, I would say yes. And what um, do, you, do you think it to be there? Well, I, I think there are, I can't remember sort of where, but there's definitely, um, well, actually, like that passage that I just read, or one of the passages I read of her feeling like she's waking up and she feels suddenly very connected with all humanity and in this weird way, feel sort of hope for them. Um, I would say that's sort of as far as her religion goes. She's clearly not, uh, doesn't believe in an afterlife, um, which religion, usually that's built into it. Uh, so mostly no, but with some moments of transcendence or seeming transcendence. Which is that, that means religiousness? It means something that, that there are experiences in here that are not 
strictly tied to physical experiences, but have to, I mean, that have to do with another part of being alive. And they may be illusory, or they may be drug Spiritual. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's definitely a spiritual dimension going on here. Um, but I think I wanted her to be, to not believe in God, because I wanted her to be, to me, and I, I don't mean this in any kind of disrespectful way, it would be sort of a go-to place that maybe would keep her from dealing with what she exploring and sort of still searching somehow because not that if you believe in God you don't stop you don't stop searching but there's a certain answer to a question which I'm not sure what the answer to that and question is and I don't want her to have her to have the answer yeah. Any, anybody else oh. yes uh, there was a question in our class that no one has asked yet. Nancy, are you going to ask uh, it? Well, I was going to ask a question about one of the characters, John Winter. Yeah. Who brings the liver, the heart, the, we don't know what that is, and he's wearing the stained suit. Mm -hmm. So we were debating in class about who he was. Some, some people in class were saying, well, that's Harris. And you haven't read carefully. Wait, is it not a theory? What's the other thing? It's not a theory. He's, he's, yeah. a, he's in the book. He was at the wedding and, and, and danced with him. That's right. And he asked her for advice because he was getting married. That's right. Susan is now conducting an oral exam. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That's who he is. And she right? Him and so what friend. about him? She, she, she asked, does she make you laugh? Right? Is that? Yes. So what was his reason? So he was a little bit of a uh, kind of and Lord, he was the same uh, a sort of mini relationship to Anne Lord that Anne Lord was to Harris, i.e. someone important that maybe she didn't even remember, as we are. The question that came up most in the class, and one mm -hmm. that is of general interest to writers, I think, is one that I share, one, a question that I share, which is how specific is this book about this particular character and her relationship to her life, to her children, to her husbands, to her illness, and so on, and how much do you mean did you hope the reader would find a kind of universality in it? Is this a character study? Or is it a book that is both a character study and also about uh, anyone's life, looking back? Or well, I would say a character study has universality right. in it, because we're all characters. <laughs> um, and to see someone's very specific version is a, um, I would say, a uniting experience to, to understand. Instead of, oh yeah, that's like everything's alike. It's sort of, oh, there's that version that's not quite the same as other versions maybe or I've version. seen. Right. Yeah, or my version. So it's a way, you know, you read about her life and if you are, you know, not put off too much by the illness and by the fact that she wasn't a really warm woman and you know, all these things that are quite off-putting, hopefully you come away experiencing someone else's experience of life, which is not quite like yours. So uh, I definitely would, given a choice at the turn in the road, it's like choosing, not choosing the punctuation. I would not choose what it would seem how this should right. naturally go. Yes. Right. 
So, so. So quite particular. Quite a to particular her, life. but maybe I would say probably shares at different points right. many different things with all of us. Yeah. Or I don't know know what kind of time yeah. do we have time? Yes, by all means. Uh, Anybody. Yeah. Talk at the same time. Mrs. <laughs> the first exchange you and I ever had before our daughters became friends was when you and Joseph O'Neill were speaking at a PS3 fundraising evening. And I asked you, yeah. um, how do you juggle being a parent and being a writer? Your response on that evening was, well, I haven't managed to finish a book since my kid went to school. If evening was the book you've just completed, and knowing your remarkable life force of a daughter, <laughs> how do you believe your book would have been influenced, and why? If I had written this while I had a child, you mean? With knowing the child you have, it would have, it would have, it would have I, I wouldn't have been able to write this book. <laughs> but the book that I've just finished is actually, it's, it's another harrowing subject. It's, um, it's part of it, well, it's, it's set in Eastern Africa, and um, it follows two different characters, and one of the characters is a, a 16-year-old a Ugandan girl who's been kidnapped by, you know, bandits and uh, lived with them for a year and a half before she escapes and she's trying to sort of um, cope with her experience. So I, I did write that while I was raising <laughs> my daughter. In fact, I've even dedicated the book to her, but she's not going to read it for a long time, I don't think. Yes? Um, I'm sorry, I haven't read the book yet. It's okay. But If you got yourself out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you came away with an appreciation, maybe a greater appreciation of what? Um, I would say it's almost, uh, what's the word? It's, it's like when things are, life is like extremes a little bit, and the more painful things happen, somehow the more appreciation there is for life on the other end. I think that's, at a certain point in my life, that started to happen. <laughs> um, I also uh, have been preoccupied with dying for a long time, and there was definitely a conscious decision to think, or dying, or death, a preoccupied with death, I would say. So to think about it um, in this way, and imagine a scenario, and create it, and, and, and be with it, was sort of a way of focusing that obsession, I guess. So, and that's, you know, it's, it's not that it's therapeutic, it's just, you know, I think we, we are concerned with things, we focus on things, if we write stories, we write stories that are the subjects of things that preoccupy us. So, um, I was in a dark place already. <laughs> but the question was, as you wrote, the, I think the question was, as you wrote the book, did it depress you, and if it did, how did you get, were there methods that you had, or techniques to get out of it? No, I stayed in the depression. <laughs> to be done. No, it would, it would definitely be a downer. It was definitely a downer some of the time. But I also find, um, though there are, you know, I'm not a complete masochist, there are pleasures in writing, you know. Um, there are pleasures in, even if you're writing about something disturbing, to um, describe it. Well, that has, you know, as you all know, to kind of, you know, really hit the nail on the head is very satisfying. And it, and it gives you a kind of, you know, it's like you've made something. You've, you've, 
you've kind of taken that sort of uneasiness that's just bothering you and, and you've described it and it, I won't even say it helps because I'm not, it's not even about helping, it's just there's, just, there's something satisfying there. Um, but I do find the process of writing is, you know, at the end of four hours of writing, you don't, you know, you're not frolicky, you know, <laughs> you're just really not. You, you just come out and you're kind of, uh, and you can get out of it after you have a drink or, you know, you can get out of it when you talk to someone for five minutes, but it, <laughs> Creation happens in, you know, I mean, it may be not the same with dancers, they get to move around, or, you know, but you're going only into your head, and only your hand is moving. You know, everything is very, very still, and you have to suspend a lot of your experience of being alive, you know. You have to, you have to suspend all of that, or it's not going to get written down. And so, to sort of emerge out of it, there is a, a disorienting kind of moment, and if you, if you had too many hours like that, you, you know, you've only got so much kind of, you know, resources to keep yourself cheerful, so you know, you feel, you know, that's why you see these, this look of draining, this drained expression you see on, on writers a lot, particularly <laughs> while, they're, while they're working. It's just, you know, I mean, every once in a while you hear some people say, I love it, it was fun, it was playful, I decided, you know, they're writing, and that's, that's not, you know, that's just not my way, I guess. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? Can yeah. Um, in Lust, it's a list of lovers, and it's a list of really specific details, and even though we're, you're saying you're not a frolicky writer, to me, in the evening, the lists of, she cooked the hot dog, she did the dishes. I'd like to be a frolicky writer. I'm just saying the process of writing doesn't but, but inspire. To me, those lists uh -huh. brought that kind of energy of a life speeding by with meaningless things, but I'm just curious about when you feel a list coming on, like, does it come out all at once, or is that a very, like... Some of the lists were long, you know, like... That list was probably twice as long, that yeah. story, yeah. originally. And um, I, you know, that's probably, you know, the writing of that story is like a smaller version of the way I write most things, I would say. Little takes, some longer than others, and then you sort of arrange them in an order, and actually maybe this one should go back here, or this one is too poetic, or you know, have this one, this is more sort of flat, or this one, and try to balance them all out. So if it were like a you know, song, or I, I actually thought of evening like, because it would be nice to be a musician, you get to move and play and you sing, and it's um, like a symphony, as if I was writing a symphony. I don't play any music, I don't even know how you write a symphony, but I was just thinking of that as an abstract sort of structure, and to have different notes playing, and then slowly something else comes in, and by the end, you have this whole final sound, I guess. Let me just ask Magdalene's question in a different way, because I know what you're asking. When a lot of people write, at least in my editorial experience, they get really happy when they get to a list. <laughs> it's fun. They can, uh -huh. they can just, it is more nearly playful uh -huh. than the rest of the necessity of right. writing out subjects, predicates, and yeah. danglers, and so on. And, um, but there's so, sentences. There are lists of, with sentences. Right. Yeah. But don't you sometimes get a feeling of release when, you know, when you you can sort of let go a little bit and and run on in the sense, I mean, even in the Nurse Brown. Passage. Listen, that's the first. That's the first draft. I mean, hopefully, it's yeah. going and feeling fun, and you know, I mean, I, I I say to my writing students that to me, writing is like. Um, it's your if you're doing sculpture, right, which would be more fun because you'd be able to move around it and everything. You you you're first you're going to dig up the clay, right? 
because you're going to get your own clay. And you dig up the clay, and the fun part is like going out in the field and finding the right place and deciding which clay you want, and you're outside, you know, and you dig it up, and it's really good, and you think, oh, this is like a rocky part, but I'll save that for this. And it's all the fun part. And then you have this blob, and then you think, I'm going to make a head. And you start to shape the head, and, you know, you say, oh, and then it all starts to really be going. And then you get... And the next 80% of the project is shaping the head and the nose, and, you know, just the difference of the eyes too wide, it looks way off, and you're, if you're really trying to get a likeness, or whatever it is, the detail that you're going for, that's going to take, you've just only spent 20% of it doing the fun part. And then the rest is 80%. Why you got the face? And the, no. <laughs> I think probably. Yeah. Um, well, one of our class wants to ask a question. Just the title. I mean, evening, yeah. evening obviously, end of one's life, evening. Is there more to it than that? Well, there is another sense of evening, right? Dan, Dan, Oh, yeah. Um, things evening out. Things evening out, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was so sweet. But that's what it that's what it that's what it's supposed to be. Joanne, I will pay you. I think there's some wine and cheese. Yes. And so why don't we have that now and get Thank out of the so dark place? <laughs> Thank you so much.